Okay, thank you, Ashok. So I guess we should move ahead to the next speaker now. Shiraz, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Hi, Shiraz. Hi. Yeah, so, so next speaker is Shiraz Minwala. He'll tell us about the Hilbert space of matter chain Simmons theory. I'll let you know roughly when you are, you know, if you're going over time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Shiraz, over to you. Okay, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, uh, okay. Make it a bit, bit bigger. Yeah. Make it bigger? Uh, let's see. Might help, no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, uh, so you know, thank you for the invitation to speak, and it's, of course, a pleasure to be back at ISM. Uh, my talk today is titled The Hilbert Space of uh, Chern Simons Matter Theories and is based uh, principally on a uh, on a long paper that hopefully will really be out this month, uh, as well as a lot of earlier work. The long paper uh, that the, the stock is principally based on is written in collaboration with uh, uh, Naveen, uh, with Amyo Mishra, my uh, graduating student, Naveen Prabhakar, who is uh, now a postdoc at ICTS, and Tarun Sharma, who is faculty member at IIT Delhi. Okay. Uh, as all of you know, Chern Simons coupled to dynamical matter fields uh, are of interest for several reasons. I'm going to list some of them as motivation for this talk. Um, first, in parity non invariant theories, the one derivative Chern Simons theory is the most relevant term, most relevant term made out of purely gauge fields that you can add to your Lagrangian. Okay? So, just this observation tells you that if you've got a parity non invariant uh, um, gauge theory in two plus one dimensions, you should expect its low energy dynamics to be governed by the Chern Simons term. And uh, uh, perhaps if there is some effective, some, a little bit of tuning, a Chern Simons ther a term coupled to matter. Um, second, Chern si the Chern Simons coupling is the inverse of an integer. Now, since an integer cannot change continuously, the inverse of an integer cannot change continuously. Therefore, the Chern Simons term cannot flow under the renormalization group. This tells you that uh, Chern Simons coupled gauge theories are very easily made conformal and give, uh, give rise very simply without any need for supersymmetry, for instance, to large classes of uh, conformal field theories. This also makes these theories sort of interesting from the point of view of study of critical phenomena and renormalization. Um, third, Chern Simons theories, especially when you add matter to them, um, exhibit phenomena that you don't normally see in ordinary quantum field theories. For instance, you, you see particles with non half integer spins um, and uh, uh, with that, that obey, have anionic statistics. And uh, the S matrices of these particles turn out to, to have uh, uh, to display non standard crossing relations under uh, crossing symmetry. Fourth, matter Chern Simons theories have. Uh, 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 sometimes have interesting uh, uh, large end dual descriptions, uh, sorry, uh, bulk dual descriptions via the ads CFT correspondence. For instance, ABGM theory is one, one such example. Vasiliev theories are others. Fifth, uh, Matter and Simons theories turn out to be uh, to exhibit an invariance under, uh, to enjoy an invariance under a sort of Bose Fermi duality. Okay, uh, this became clear only once we started studying these theories, and this Bose Fermi duality is interesting. You know, to study on its own right, in its own right. But lastly, and of primary interest to my talk, you know, these theories are both dynamically interesting, but also uh, tractable in the sense that they have, uh, they admit limits that can be exactly solved. So one limit that is famously exactly solvable in the study of John Simon's, matter John Simon's theory is the limit where you take the mass to infinity. Then you reduce to a pure John Simon's theory, which Witten solved, you know, 30 odd years ago. Um, and got, got the Fields Medal for. However, about 10 years ago, uh, we and other people realized that, uh, uh, that there's another limit of these theories that is also exactly solvable. Um, a limit where, where you keep the mass, but the, ma uh, uh, but the matter is taken to be in the fundamental representation and n is taken to infinity. Uh, in such theories, large n techniques can be used to solve these theories. Um, and uh, these theories display sort of uh, display rich dynamics in this limit. Now, solvable theories of uh, solvable limits of theories are special. Um, nice things happen in solvable limits. 
In particular, if you've got a solvable theory, you should expect that the Hilbert space of that theory has a nice structure. Um, in this talk, I'm going to attempt to answer the question, what is a matter John Simon's theory? By trying to give you a sort of um, humanly understandable description of the Hilbert space of this theory. Um, everything I say in today's talk will be only at large n, but we're hoping that some of these lessons will persist away from large n, perhaps in the analysis of supersymmetric indices. Okay, uh, the structure of this talk is going to be as follows. Um, computations over the, done over the last 10 years have given us explicit formulae for the uh, partition functions of matter and simons theories. I'm going to take that those formulae as data for this talk. What I'm going to do is take the known expressions and try to repackage them in, so that we get a, an interpretation of these results. Okay, so in this talk, I fo focus on a particular matter and simons theory. Uh, a theory of Chun Simons UN level K Chun Simons theory coupled to bosonic matter and the fundamental representation. This bosonic matter has a kinetic term, a mass term, and some interactions. Okay. Uh, this theory is sometimes in the literature is called the regular boson theory. This is the theory I will specialize, I will focus on in this talk. In our upcoming paper, we've we've studied every every ev every well understood theory, but for, because of, for the interest in the interest of time, I focus on this one theory. Okay, now, um, one quick thing that I will need from previous work about this theory is the following. You know, this, this theory is a large N theory, which as I explained, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, exactly solvable in a, at large N. Many quantities you are interested in computing can be computed exactly at large N in this theory. One of the quantities that we computed maybe three years ago, and I think I reported it on this result in the last ISM meeting, is the exact quantum effective action. By exact, I mean exact large n quantum effective action as a function of Toft coupling. Um, uh, exact large n quantum effective action of this theory um, as a function of the gauge invariant uh, operator phi bar phi. Now, the computation of this large n effective action is complicated. Okay, but well, the final result turns out to be amazingly simple. And uh, the result, the final result is simply this. But the classical effective action listed on this line here is renormalized um, for the values of phi that are relevant to the unhinged phase of the theory, which I'll focus on throughout in this talk, um, are, is renormalized simply to this quantum effective action, where all that's changed is that this one here in the classical theory has been replaced by four by three. Okay, very complicated, many pages of calculation, but fi very simple final answer. Okay. So now with this in mind, I'm going to, I'm going to try to um, ask, what, do we, what can we say about the thermal partition function of this theory? And I'm going to try to answer this question in a couple of steps. First, by trying to guess the answer using some intuition and then presenting the final answer of a genuine calculation to you. Suppose you were to try to guess the answer for the thermal partition function of, the the of this theory. One thing you might do is to say, well, first, Let's remove this. You know, what makes this theory complicated is the interaction of matter with gauge fields. So as a baby warm up, let's just try to look at the same theory, but removing the gauge fields. Uh, the one thing I'm going to do is to take not exactly the same theory, but the same theory with the classical action replaced by its quantum effective action. Okay, so it's four by three, not the one. Now, can we compute the thermal uh, partition? Yes. So, uh, so the reason for the non-renormalization of this effective action is could be due to the hidden supersymmetry. Uh, there's no supersymmetry. The there's no supersymmetry in this theory. The theory has a bosonic field, bosonic matter field, but no fermionic matter. No, so no you said you said in the beginning that there was some hidden supersymmetry in the. I don't know. Maybe you said. Uh, I, maybe I misspoke. I, I said even in the absence of supersymmetry is what I meant to say. There's no supersymmetry. Supersymmetry so plays no role in this. I, well, it'll play one role at some point, but yeah, go on. Why is, uh, why is then the effective action non-renormalized? It's not non-renormalized. It's renormalized very simply. This one has become a four by three. Why? We, we get, get it from a computation. You know, you can compute this effective action uh, at large end, and this is what we find. You know, uh, so I don't have anything more interesting to say. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, um, one might try to compute the thermal partition function of this theory. 
just the ungauged theory, but with the potential replaced by its by its quantum by its correct quantum effective action. So we've taken account one fe feature of this UN interactions, the part that renormalizes this effective potential. Now these computation is trivial to perform, so trivial that we can do it in one slide. See, take the theory that I wrote down on the last transparency, which I've rewritten here, and notice that this theory can be recast sort of exactly with the age of Lagrange multiplier field CB squared and sigma as this theory. Now, it may not be immediately apparent to your eye that these two theories are, are the same, but if you look carefully, you'll see that CB squared appears only two places, yeah? And so the CB squared equation of motion tells you that sigma is equal to 2 pi phi by, phi by phi by n. And then when you substitute sigma is equal to 2 pi phi by phi by n, uh, you recover this, uh, this, this theory here. So uh, the path integral of, of over phi and CB squared and sigma over appropriate contours uh, of this action is just exactly the same as this. Now in the large n limit, uh, we, okay. Now what we've achieved by this rewriting is we've made the dependence of, of the phi on, uh, of uh, this action on phi quadratic. So we can just integrate phi out. Phi is effectively a free scalar field with mass squared CB squared, okay? So in the large n limit, uh, you obtain the partition function here, which is just the partition function over a free Fox space of mass CB, and then some dressing factors include, uh, 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 which are functions of these Lagrange multipliers. Away from large n, we still have to do a path integral over these, these uh, Lagrange multipliers, and the, the theory is complicated. But at large n, we just have to extremize this, this, this Lagrangian with respect to these Lagrange multipliers, if we make the plausible assumption that the saddle point values are translationally invariant, we get this very simple expression for the effective uh, for the thermal partition function of this theory. The partition function of a, a free boson dressed by some factors including uh, depending on the mass and some other Lagrange multipliers and then extremized over CB squared and sigma. <laughs> okay, now the computation of the previous section works on any spatial manifold. So let's focus for the rest of this talk on the sp a spatial manifold being a sphere of volume V2. Now in such a space, it's certainly too crude to ignore the UN gauge field completely. At the very least, we should expect that the interaction with UN will impose a sort of Gauss law that will tell you that all physical states are UN singlets. So at our next level of crudity in trying to guess this, guess the answer, we might take the previous answer and then just try to project it down to, S to UN singlets. But now projecting this answer down to UN singlets, well, what does it mean? Well, all we have to do is to take the Fox space partition function and project that down to UN singlets. But that's done by twisting the partition function with respect to a, to a, uh, to a, to a UN matrix U and integrating over U. So this is the next level of uh, crudity in our, you know, next level of sophistication in our crude guesses. This is another guess you might have for this partition function. Okay. Now we're going to stop guessing and then just look at what the actual answer is. The actual answer that comes from detailed computation, including, you know, summing over many gauge, gauge boson loops and so on, infinite numbers of these uh, by Schwinger Dyson equations. The actual answer turns out to be remarkably similar to this guy. The actual answer turns out to be given by exactly the same dressing factor that we had here. Okay. But this projection of the free boson but a uh, uh, partition function projected down to the UN singlet condition replaced by this quantity IBCB, where IBCB is also very similar to what we had here. It involves an integral over a unitary matrix, the trace of the twisted partition function of a free boson, but then another factor, and crucially the point that this, this integral is performed not over the Haar measure as it was previously, but with a, with a deformed measure. I'm going to tell you what this measure is. The deformed measure is, is, is defined as follows. The deformed measure is just the Haar measure. However, you know, you define an eigenvalue density function as usual when you're dealing with large n matrix integrals. And you limit your integration regime to those, uh, those, those unitary matrices such that point-wise, the eigenvalue distribution function is never larger than one over two pi mod lambda. Where lambda was the Toft coupling of this uh, churn side. This is what comes out of computation. Okay, so comparing the naive answer with the actual answer, we see that the only difference between these two answers is that the projection down to UN singlets of the Fox based singlet uh, of the Fox based partition function is replaced by this more complicated quantity, 
which is almost a, a, like a projection down to UN singlets, except it's done with a funny measure and it has uh, an extra pop factor. Okay, I will now explain that this funny thing, this IB, has a beautiful interpretation. IB is simply the projection of the free Fermi Fox space down to the space of West Zemino Witten singlets. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, uh, what we call the type 1 UN theory, which is a UN theory whose SUN level is K and U1 part of level is Kappa. Um, uh, just for simplicity, the, the many other theories that are of interest, and we've done them all in a bit. Okay, so two minutes of background. Consider pure Chern Simon's theory on S2 times S1 with M Wilson lines, or one at each point on the on different points on the sphere, wrapping time. These Wilson lines are taken to be in representations R1, R2, up to Rm. Okay, in his classic work on Chern Simon's theory, Witten demonstrated that the result of this path integral was simply the number of conformal blocks in chiral Wessemino Witten theory uh, with insert, primary operator insertions of R1 in representations R1 up to Rm. This number of conformal blocks can be evaluated using the Weldon Day formula, uh, but can also be directly evaluated in three dimensions as we're now going to describe, as I'm now going to describe. Basically, the, there are two methods that we've employed in our paper. Uh, one of them is just to directly evaluate this path integral using a method developed by Blau and Thompson about 30 years ago. Chen Simon series is simple enough, pure Chen Simon series, simple enough theory that you can directly evaluate these path integrals. Uh, Blau and Thompson worked in the case of SUN, S, SUN theory, really they were very explicit for SU2 theory. We generalized their results to type 1 UNK theory. There's a subtlety that we have to take care of in that generalization. The second method we use uh, along these lines is, uh, uh, is to use supersymmetry. We use the fact that pure John Simon theory uh, is the same as pure n equals 2 supersymmetric John Simon theory. And so we can compute Wilson line expectation values using supersymmetric localization. Both these methods give us the same answer, uh, an answer that can also be shown to be, agree with the Valinde formula, but in a form that is much more useful to us than you might have originally got from the Valinde formula. Okay, one quick caution, all formulae apply only to rep representations in integrable representations, you know, uh, Wilson lines in integrable representations. Um, it would be very interesting to understand this point better. Okay, so with all these caveats out of the way, um, yeah, now, Maybe 70 or 80 pages in our upcoming paper are devoted to these technicalities, which I'm brush brushing aside in two slides, um, and devoted to formulae like, like this and their, st their study. Uh, but uh, uh, in tomorrow's, in his talk tomorrow, Naveen Prabhakar will describe this, these technical aspects in, in much more detail than I am. So I'm just going, going to give you the final result. <laughs> ah, the result is this, um, the total number of singlets Okay, if you've got these insertions of operators, the total number of singlets, uh, total number of conformal blocks is given by a very simple formula. What you're supposed to do is to evaluate the characters of your representations on unitary matrices whose eigenvalues are sort of special. All eigenvalues have to be either a kappath root of unity or a kappath root of minus one, depending on whether n is odd or even. Okay. You have to choose the eigenvalues to be distinct kappa roots of unity or minus one and sum over all such choices uh, with this Vandermont type measure with the normalization and with the insertions of the characters. Once you do that, that sum uh, always evaluates an to an integer and always gives you the number of conformal blocks. Okay, uh, Naveen will tell you more about this tomorrow. Now, this formula here is uh, those of you who are familiar with the little group theory will see that this formula is a very particular discretization of the while integral formula of classical group theory. In particular, in the large n limit, the spacing between different allowed eigenvalues goes to zero. And this, this sum over eigenvalues reduces to, a, uh, reduces to an integral over eigenvalue density functions. However, because the eigenvalues are discrete and cannot be occupied twice, when you see what kind of continuous eigenvalue distribution functions contribute, you conclude that this, uh, uh, the only eigenvalue distribution functions are, that contribute are those whose density of eigenvalues obeys an inequality, in fact, precisely the inequality we saw before, namely that the eigenvalue density function cannot be pointwise larger than 2 pi by lambda. Okay, so, so now the restriction to UN, to uh, uh, 
waste amino witten signals turns into an integral which is just the analog of integrating over unitary matrices except that you do it with this funny measure this measure which restricts you to this to particular space of eigenvalue density functions and uh, uh, so we see we've almost declared we, we can almost declare victory you might have thought that if this other funny term wasn't there this quantity would now be the restriction of the bosonic hilbert space fox space to the space of west amino witten signals but this other term is there and what does it mean and the other term is actually reminding us that something that we did was going too far. We, we, were, we, were, we, were, we, were, we were going too fast. So let me remind you that the partition function over the bosonic Hilbert space is simply a partition, a free bosonic Fox space, simply a partition function of each single particle state one at a time. And because there are both fundamentals and anti-fundamentals, we've got two factors for each state. This, this uh, uh, product here is a product over all single particle states of the sphere, bosonic single particle states of the sphere. Okay, this is just the usual Bose way of writing a free boson partition function. Ws are the eigenvalues of this of this unitary matrix. But the partition function in any given state can be then expanded in an in a sum over un characters. Because we're looking at bosons, the only characters that appear are characters in the completely completely symmetric representations with n boxes, where n runs from zero to infinity. So what we computed, what, the, what, what, what this formula without this quantity here would have computed would be to use the formula, the path integral formula for the Verlinde formula and put insert the West amino witten singlet condition on this sum. However, that does not correctly count conformal blocks. That does not correctly con count conformal blocks because the path integral formula that I gave you was correctly counting conformal blocks only when all representations that were inserted were integrable representations. Uh, there are no conformal blocks with non-integrable insertions. This was explained by Gepner and Witten over 35, maybe 35 years ago. So what we're supposed to do if we're really interested in looking at the restriction to conformal blocks is to take the sum and truncate it to integrable representations. Okay. Now, um, the truncation to integrable representations is, is integrable representations, is just those whose row lengths are less than or equal to kappa KB. So the truncation to inter integrable representations is simply given by truncating this sum to KB. Not to, the upper limit should go to KB, not to infinity. Okay. <laughs> and then when you process that, you find that that's the same thing as replacing this 1 over 1 minus ZIY, this infinite kind of product without the truncation, but dressing it by an upstairs factor that kills off all the other terms. So now when you look at the partition function, you need to take... Um, logs of this term but as well as this term now this term here in in the in the context the physical context y is equal to eta minus uh, b, uh, e to the power minus beta into e minus uh, e minus mu and it's raised to a very large power kappa, which is going to infinity in the large n limit so there's a discontinuous difference between this term the between the log of this term here uh, uh, depending on whether y is less than one or greater than one. When y is less than one, this log just vanishes. That's the case where all states have energies less than the chemical potential. When y is greater than one, on the other hand, this guy, this term gives you a kappa log y, a uh, log of, a, um, uh, yeah, sorry, this should have been a, a kappa log y. Okay. Where was it? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and when you, uh, when you, you process all this and put, you know, sum over all the single particle states on the sphere, you recover exactly this factor. Okay, so this this partition function IB here is precisely the truncation of this of this uh, Fox space of bosons to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the West amino, to set of West amino witten singlets to set of non-trivial West amino witten conformal blocks. In the last slide, we've learned something important. What we realize now, you know, the, the interpretation of truncating the sum to K rather than infinity tells you that no single particle state can be occupied by more than KB bosons. Call this fact the this, this, this phenomenon the bosonic exclusion principle. It's the direct level rank dual of the more obvious result for fermionic theory, namely that no single particle fermionic state can be occupied more than NF times simply because there are no more than NF different distinct fermions uh, to occupy in a state consistent with uh, Pauli statistics. Okay. Now, 
Recall that ordinary free boson, bosonic theories are ill-defined the values of the chemical potential greater than the mass, as that leads to a catastrophic Bose condensation. These sta some states are infinitely occupied. That problem is removed in these theories by the bosonic exclusion principle because no state can be occupied more, more than kb times. So this, this phenomenon tells us that this Ch matter Chan simons theory, the Chan simons will cure that the runaway instability of free bosons uh, at chemical potential larger than larger than mu, uh, larger than the mass. Okay. Um, so just to re recall, a partition function is given by just a very simple guess, but by replacing the projection of the bosonic Fox space to UN singlets to the projection to West amino witten singlets. Now, uh, there are two or three things I want to emphasize about this result. The first is that every for a sphere of, you know, both big and small spheres. Now, the projection onto UN singlets is trivial in the limit that the sphere size goes to infinity. This is because it's like one condition, like n square conditions, n square Gauss law conditions imposed on a very large Fox space, and that those n square conditions are meaningless. This is well well known. Okay, what is the what is the corresponding situation with these West amino witten singlets? Well, that's easy to analyze. You see, at five, even if we just take this projection of the free boson partition function, we can do that at finite n n k. Even though the formula is really valid, only at large n k, we can this part of the analysis can eas easily be done at finite n k, and uh, requires us to you know perform a summation over all eigenvalue distributions like the uh, eigenvalue configurations if, uh, obeying this condition. Now, in the limit that the number of insertions that you put into the Verlinde formula goes to infinity, you can easily show that this sum reduces to a saddle point, I mean, it reduces to one term. It just is dominated by the one eigenvalue configuration that contributes maximally. And you can also, well, show or plausibly argue, maybe is more accurate, that the one eigenvalue configuration that dominates this, this thing is the eigenvalue configuration I've listed here. Um, for those of you familiar with West amino witten the uh, theory and Verlinde formula kind of thing, it's the eigenvalue configuration dual by via the Verlinde formula to the identity representation. It's a very very special eigenvalue. Okay, this this dominates that sum. Okay, because this dominates that sum, the partition function of the Bosonic theory, which was you know something like this and then summed over various eigenvalues. Because only one term is contributing this limit, it's just a product of partition functions, one for each single particle state. Okay, so you get a product of partition functions, one for each single particle state. And so the partition function starts looking like it's free. Because that's that's how free partition functions are. You get a partition function, one for each single particle state, and then product of all of these. Okay, however, this partition function is not really free. It's not really free because these ZAs here are not genuine partition functions in the sense that their expansion is not in terms of integers. Okay, um, in particular, you can work out the formula for these ZAs. And uh, it turns out that this formula here is given by um, uh, this expression where, odd, where combinatorial factors, ordinary combinatorial factors that would have been integers here in, in the ordinary free bosonic theory are replaced by more complicated quantities, uh, which are given here, the Q version analogs of these combinatorial factors, and they have simple rep, uh, interpretation in chat, uh, Chern, uh, in Chern, in Chern Simons or West Amino-Witten theory. Um, they are the uh, quantum dimensions of the n-box symmetric representation. Okay, um, there's a similar expression here. I've not presented fermions through this talk, but everything I, I've said here goes through also for fermions, has a, an analog for fermions. Now, what's the point here? Why, 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 why have I brought this up? Uh, Ignoring all details for the moment, um, a completely striking aspect of this large volume limit is that it's a product of part your partition function becomes a product of partition functions one for each um, each single particle state. However, the single particle state partition functions are now deformed away from their free values. So this naively suggests the theory is becoming free, but we've seen that, that can't be the case because these single particle partition functions have non-integer, you know, when th their expansion is not in terms of integer. There's no well-defined single particle Hilbert space. What's going on? How can it be that a theory is both interacting, it's not free, but its partition function is a product of single particle partition functions? Sounds like a contradiction, right? It's a product because what's happening here doesn't affect what's happening there. But if, if that's the case, it should be free. Um, uh, we've thought sort of hard about this and we came to the conclusion that uh, uh, 
what's going on here is something very interesting. Turns out that the representation theory, the fusion algebra of Wesumino Witten theories, or at least we conjecture, we've not 100% proved this, but we've got given good evidence for what I'm saying now, uh, um, has a very interesting universality. The universality goes like this. Suppose you take a bunch of representations and then you fuse them and then fuse them and fuse them and then look at their complete representation content. And you ask how many representations of type of this type do I get? And how many representations of that type do I get when, when I do the continued fusing? To get the actual answers, the actual numbers, when you've got a finite number of insertions, um, well, that depends on the details of what you've inserted. But in the limit that the number of representations becomes very large, um, the ratios of these numbers, sort of independent of what you've inserted, take on a universal, uh, universal flavor. The, the ratios of these numbers become the ratio of the quantum dimensions of the, uh, of the corresponding representations. So as I say, we've not completely proved this, but we've given substantial, we've given what I think considers substantial evidence for the state. Now this explains this, part, uh, this, this uh, factorization of the partition function, because you see, one way of thinking of how one state contributes, how, the interactions of one state with all the others are only through this wesumino witten singlet projection condition. The universality tells us that the interactions effectively, I mean, from the point, of, except perhaps in a constant overall, does not depend on the details of what's happening in the other states because you get universal ratios of numbers. Okay, um, uh, one last thing, and I'm sort of done. But one one last thing is 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 the follow is as follows: these single particle partition functions are sort of interesting, and uh, um, as I said, there is sort of deformation of the single particle partition function for free bosons, but uh, um, these. Uh, 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 they are Q deformation. Um, okay, maybe I don't have the time to explain this in much detail, but uh, you know you can take these numbers, and of course there's one limit where Q goes to one, where they reduce to the ordinary single particle bosonic partition function. But there's another limit, a limit that I've uh, uh, listed here, in which they become the numbers you would see in a single in a free fermion single particle partition function. So in some sense, these single particle fun uh, part uh, particle functions interpolate continuously between those of free bosons and free fermions. Okay, and uh, that's naturally ties in with duality. Um, on the other hand, when you know, when we're somewhere in the middle, they're neither free bosons nor free bo fermions. It's something else. It's a new statistic. Okay, just to give you a flavor of the kind of thing that happens, the expectation number of number of particles in a given single particle state, um, it takes this value in for free boson theory. This is something we're all familiar with. Um, in the large end limit at fixed lambda, this formula is generalized to this sort of uglier, but still quite simple looking formula that generalizes this, this fix. So there's a completely new statistic. Um, oh, oh, yeah, fine. Okay, so what have we concluded? So we've concluded that basically all that change between our simple guess of taking the ungauged theory and restricting to UN singlets um, was that we had to restrict not to UN singlet, but singlets, but to Wesumino witten singlets. Okay, what do we conclude? This is surprising in many ways. You see, when you actually solve this theory, you integrate out, we do it by integrating out the gauge fields. Now that integrating out the gauge fields gives you a horribly non-local action. And then you put that horribly non-local action into the quantity you want to compute and you get an answer. What I've just tried to explain to you is that the entire effect, as far as, as far as the large the partition function is concerned, the entire effect of integrating out that gauge field is one completely local thing, which is renormalizing the quantum effective action. And other than that, all the other non-locality plays just one role, namely imposing this Westermino witten singlet condition. So the theory is effectively local, but subject to this one non-local constraint, uh, written just in terms of matter. The whole effect of integrating out the gauge field is to impose that one constraint. Okay, so we have conclusions. Um, I, I think I'm out of time, so I won't, won't spell out these conclusions. Maybe I can say just two things here. Two things I'd really like to do is this. First, I'd like to take the supersymmetric index of supersymmetric matter John Simon's theories at finite NNK and see if I can interpret those formulae in, in language similar to those, uh, uh, some deformation of what I've used in this, this, this talk. Uh, this sort of almost guaranteed to work at large N. But I wanted to see whether something like this holds also at finite NNK. Since supersymmetric indices are available, this seems like a plausible project. 
the second thing I want to say is that something that's sort of irritating uh, and is sort of central to our paper is the fact that we that when we evaluated the path integral of matter chan Simon, oh sorry, of just pure chan Simon's theory with insertions, the fact that we one th the thing that we know from Wesselmino Witten theory, namely that if you put a non-integrable representation into the into the path integral, you get zero, does not automatically seem to come out of the path integral. I suspect, you know, there's subtlety in the path integral that makes that happen. I would really like to understand why that, is, that that's the case. Uh, this is very important because that that is the underlying mechanism between these before uh, for this both exclusion principle. Okay, thank you. Okay, one quick question, Rajesh. Rajesh, you have to unmute. Yeah, hello, sorry. Uh, no thanks, problem. Shiraz, uh, very nice talk. Uh, just uh, actually uh, two uh, uh, two small questions. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned the, how the Chan Simons theory regulates the Bose condensation catastrophe. Uh, uh, so I was just wondering if you take the limit as this stuffed coupling goes to zero, uh, is there a universality there? I mean, uh, because, you get it diverges in that limit, right? Presumably, yes. as the the coupling goes to zero, and you're regulating that divergence. But I was. Uh, I can't hear you anymore, Rajesh. Is that me or? Uh, something universal. Ra Rajesh, you're going in and yeah. out. Uh, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? The question. Yeah. The yeah, uh, I, we, I heard you up to if if you take the if you take KB to be large, is there something universal? And then I could hear you. Yeah, uh, whether the, the, there's something universal to that divergent piece, because you might expect in actual physical systems uh, similar divergence is regulated, um, and and there might be something universal to that. I, I just was wondering yeah. if you had any thought about, or does it have a nice form? The divergent well, the coefficient actually, of the 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 thing that diverges. Yeah. You know, actually, it's very simple. Very, there's one very simple thing to say about it, well, which is this. You see, um, one way of understanding what's going on is to dualize. When you dualize, this, this guy becomes a Fermi uh, surface. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Now, the Fermi surface is not divergent in any way in this lambda goes to zero limit because uh, because that's it's just some nice Fermi surface. Right. The way that works is that th that divergence is entirely a fa this factor of n. Okay. You know, uh, bosonic partition functions are naturally proportional to n, nb, mm -hmm. and fermionic partition functions are naturally proportional to nf. Okay. And in this weak coupling limit, uh, where the bosonic coupling is very weak, nb is getting parametrically larger than nf. Okay. So this divergence is entirely somehow seeing that fact, that overall outside fact. You can take that overall piece sort of out, and after that becomes just the theory of a Fermi surface. Hmm. But that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It is. And actually, you see how it's happening, right? You know, basically, what's a Fermi surface? A famous Fermi surface is a, a, something when all states up to a certain energy are occupied. Mm -hmm. um, in the Fermi surface, all states are occupied once. Fine. Mm -hmm. If you have NF fermions, all states would be N occupied NF times. Here we get a Bose Fermi surface, a Bose surface, because all states are occupied at zero temperature, but occupied NB times. Sorry, mm -hmm. KB times. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar in spirit. You know, you you have a hard space in uh, in uh, in momentum space. You know, hard surface in momentum space. You would have all these collective excitations of this Bose Bose content. So it basically turns this boson into a Fermi surface, into a gas of Fermi on somehow. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. So uh, thanks. Uh, uh, I had a smaller second question, but maybe in the interest of time, I can uh, skip that. Thanks. Thanks, Shiraz. Okay. Thank you.